and I speak in it about my plan for the revolution in 2000. Sorry about that. And of course, the American ambassador described my plans to be highly improbable and completely unrealistic in the report. Uh, why would I speak with the American government? Because the American government is the biggest ally of Mubarak regime and now the biggest ally of the military and we are always trying to get them not to give that support to our enemies by talking, I mean at least I was taking that initiative, talking, negotiating, trying to make them understand we are not against anybody, we just want freedom and democracy. So this is why. Uh, Anyway, so by the end of 2010, this whole thing had proven to be a total failure because this movement was only about two and a half dozen members, two-thirds trying to overthrow the, this dictator and the movement, and one-third is loyal to him. Uh, they became very successful only on the media, pretending always like hijacking events. And so on, this is the April 6th youth movement, and Ahmed Mayhem, my former this is the movement that is that had become very corrupt. Yes, yeah. Which was the movement that I created. It was actually the one that I co-founded. Let's say. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the situation seemed very dark, very impossible to achieve because my plan was based on taking advantage of the rigging. I expected would take place in the parliamentary elections in November 2010, which happened in a terrible way as I expected, even more, because they didn't leave one single seat to be contested even for cosmetics. So it was totally rigged, and there is no movement to use in order to actually start spreading this. The, the idea was to use those semi-independent small cells to agitate the people and to build defiance in different areas so that we can launch a revolution in April or in July or uh, uh, like 23rd of July, the, the, the anniversary of the universe, uh, uh, 2011, in one of the two events depending on if we can create a critical mass. Uh, this was a failure, so it seemed like it's impossible. We have failed. One former... Uh, uh, officer in the intelligence, he was a major in the intelligence, did something that was very brave, a suicide actually, because he put on the internet his face, his information, and very important uh, and very terrible information about the plans of the regime to put the country on the verge of civil war by starting terrorist attacks and sabotage uh, in order to make a huge crackdown and to make sure that they can pass the succession scenario safely from father to son and that there has to be a revolution as soon as possible, otherwise we are all lost. He disappeared, his name was Ayman Salim, Major Ayman Salim, he disappeared. He was taken by the... Of course, he was a, an intelligence officer. I'm saying former because of course he's no longer in the intelligence. I have no idea what happened to him. But he was real. Ayman Salim was real. Uh, anyway, so then there was a terrible incident that happened on New Year's Eve 2010-2011 that proved what he said because there was this terrorist attack uh, against a church in Alexandria called the Two Saints Church, which claimed the lives of over like four dozen people. And this was a big shock for everyone. So we were terribly disturbed. And then we found that something very strange had happened that a couple of days after this attack, and despite all these stupid stupid theories that they were putting on the paper, they, they cleansed the, the scene of the attack without forensics examining, which proved the evidence, that the obvious, that, that, that this, this must have been orchestrated by them. Afterwards, we knew the truth, it was there was a terrorist organization led by the Minister of the Interior and they were responsible for many terrorist attacks in order to renew emergency laws or crackdowns and so on. So, uh, but back then, it was speculation, just trying to use common sense, no evidence. Well, we started something that was very new. Starting from January 3rd, and for four days, we started a huge uh, amount of uh, huge rallies in an area called Chobra. This is my neighborhood in Cairo, because this neighborhood is the biggest neighborhood in Cairo. It has about 7 million people. 
and two, uh, uh, one third of the population there is Coptic Christian, which makes it the, the highest number or concentration of Christians in the Middle East altogether, over two million people in this spot. And we uh, we started the, the protest, of course, first we were attacked, like the, some cops came at the end of our protest with crosses and with very sectarian and uh, angry slogans against us accusing us of being murderers and we explained that it's not like that and we are all brothers and it's not that we are doing anything it's the regime we have to see the obvious there is this there is this there is this they understood and that was the beginning of muslim christian huge rallies at that time that destroyed this plan ruined the plan of the regime to create sectarian violence which brought them crazy they really tried to initiate violence as i was part of this uh, uh, of some situations, but I, I can tell you later because it's, there's too much to say. Uh, then, uh, afterwards, uh, there was uh, unfortunately a, a, an end to this because the religious institutions they follow what the state says, and uh, there is a hierarchy in the Orthodox Church, so the people had to listen to what their priests tell them, and then it became useless that Muslims would go out of these rallies, so it's, it's over. Tunisia was getting very strong, of course, uh, becoming it was the riots uh, and the protest became a revolution. So some people started to imitate what Muhammad Bouazizi did and put themselves on fire, killing themselves in public places to awake the nation. So eight. Is this now? That that was in early January. How many people killed? Eight, but different occasions. And despite all this, we 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 tried to make protests. We would call upon the internet, like uh, you know. We would call everybody and like revolution and so on and like Tunisia and people are dying and failure. It's only us, a few dozen people and uh, surrounded by large troops and behind all these troops people are passing, you know, thinking we're crazy. Nobody of course would be crazy enough to join us. Okay, so this happened a few days few of our friends were arrested and our numbers were a little smaller so we stopped. January 14th there was a day when something different happened because suddenly this uh, guy, his name is Omar Afifi, a friend of mine, I was even with him on the phone now but we always disagree with each other because he's a former policeman, he's a former police colonel and uh, with this security mentality he's very rough, he's not like a tactician is more like an operation person. So anyway, he said on the internet that he got inner information from the Ministry of the Interior that it was the regime that was behind that attack and that the regime is going to start other attacks uh, and that there's got to be a revolution on January 25th. He was the first to put the date. So I have to give him that credit. But of course, for me, when I saw this, I thought, oh my God, has Omar gone mad? What's he doing? This is so irresponsible. You cannot set a date for something that you call a revolution in this sense in 10 days. This is like, for how many times should we fail? You know, people would lose every hope. We need to at least to give them something. But unfortunately, uh, some people saw what he did and they put it on another Facebook page, which is very widespread had over 400,000 uh, members, it's called We Are All Khali Saeed. Khali Saeed was a victim of brutal murder by security, beaten up to death in front of dozens of witnesses, in front of his home. Anyway, there is also a long story about that I can explain later. Then, uh, Don't this... Don't feel rushed, by the way. Uh, yeah, no, because is, there is so much to yeah, say, so yeah, I have yeah, to yeah, jump yeah. and just Wanna mention all, like, yeah. headlines, you know? You can, you can slow down. Yeah. Like, hey, could you give us your name again, like please? Ahmed Salah. Thank you. Yeah, I know. I like Thank you. Yeah. And uh, he's an activist, one of the organizers of Arab Spring this is in really Egypt. Good. This is really good. So now everybody knows who you are. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, we're gonna we're gonna get this video everywhere. By the way. Oh good. <laughs> well, so uh, this had started to develop into several other Facebook pages and different groups. Everybody's talking about this on the internet. And it felt at that time like, oh, everybody's talking about revolution. We should do something, you know. So we had a meeting the next day, like, of course, activists would meet. We were like three dozen people. We were filling a room, maybe 70, 80 people. 
Eight that's or six movements? No, no, it was everybody. It was everybody. Everybody, different <coughs> different movements. Part of April, April 6 was there. Other yeah, yeah, some, there. some, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but we are not that many. As I said, yeah. the movement was 50 people. Like, uh, no, we were about uh, maybe 70 to 80 people. Wow. That, that was everybody from like four different movements and a few independents. We, yeah, and by the way, they, th those, this was not the number to start with. I will get to that. So we were discussing what should we do, and uh, we, uh, I, I spoke about that we should do something that is a little bigger than what we have planned before, because we planned before to have a protest on January 25th because it's a police day, something we did the year before also. So it's nothing new, but now they are talking about the revolution. This is the difference. And uh, then uh, they decided that uh, uh, we should make a protest in front of the Ministry of the Interior at 2 p.m. Uh, on that day, I had like some other suggestions. We'll talk about that later. Anyway, so that was it. I, some of them. I left some very frustrated, them. thinking we have failed. Yes. It's all over. People are talking about the revolution, I thought. And we are trying to make a protest that is doomed to fail because there is no way we make a protest in front of the Ministry of uh, Interior, uh, the headquarters of the police on that day, on the day of the police. And uh, unfortunately, uh, this had been like the feeling with everybody that, you know, there is nothing to do. The next morning I had a phone call from a friend who said that uh, let's meet up and see like what to do. So I met him in the morning and then I had this idea about doing something that I needed someone to encourage me to do, someone to be with me because it's kind of awkward to do it alone. <laughs> which is to go around pretending I'm a reporter and asking people questions, listening to the people. And I did that. Uh, I had this uh, set of questions, like uh, I could get them to a person and get the answers, maybe in five minutes or something, as an average. And I'm going to tell you the questions and the different types of answers that I received. And this was very, very important because that shaped the way things had developed afterwards. From this point, the story is very different from what you've been hearing on the news. So, I had this uh, kind of not really very authentic uh, reporter ID card. <laughs> not like it's real, it's, of course, it's, it's, it's real, but it's, uh, I'm not a reporter, but I, I managed to make it, you know. So, I've been using it in order to get into places. Because as a reporter, you can get into places you cannot go to as a citizen, as a normal person. So uh, I, I will show, I would show this to give people like confidence and trust, so they, they see that I'm not bullshitting them. So, hey, good morning. We are reporters, and we are this is my idea, and we are making a little story about the protest on January 21st. Have you heard of the January 21st protests? What protests? Of course not. What are you talking about? Uh, answers like that. Not a single person heard about. Okay, next. Well, these protests are against the regime of Hosni Mubarak because many people think that he destroyed this country and he had put it down the drains, etc. What do you think of Hosni Mubarak? So I had here different answers. I had like one third of the people completely supportive of Hosni Mubarak, two thirds very, very angry and totally against Hosni Mubarak. The one third that was supportive to Hosni Mubarak would say exactly what they've been hearing on the media. His wisdom is at the resort to all world leaders who that go to him, solve their problems, or whatever. <laughs> uh, his wisdom had put us in stabilities for I don't know how long, and this and that. So, you know, they, they would just say what they've been hearing. It's, it's, he is the shield that protects us from the conspiracies of the Zionists and the American imperialists. Because this is what the media does. <coughs> so they would they would say these things. At the end of the day, I was trying to understand why they were saying this and uh, who were they. Uh, it was very important that actually they were the poorest of all that I spoke to who gave me these supportive Muslim <coughs> Barak words. The poorest of all. They were the most suffering, the most crushed, and there could be two reasons for why they said that. 
either because of lack of security, so a lack of trust, meaning they would have to say what they don't, what they don't believe in, as a way to protect themselves, or actually because they were brainwashed by the media. But that anyway had helped me change my mind about something I believed in for a long time. That the revolution comes always from the most suffering. The most suffering are the ones that should rebel. But I, I understood that it's not always like this. It, it, you, you have, it's not enough that you suffer. You have to suffer. You have to be aware of your suffering, of the problem, of the source of the problem, and the necessity to change it and how to change it. And you have to stand on solid ground so that you are not so fragile and are capable of doing that fight. Because you would need to eat, you would need to have a place, you would need this, you would need that. And if you have a responsibility, it's like shackles in your feet, you cannot move. And you will have to play along for your family. So that was an important lesson. The, then I will get to those two-thirds that were against us. So, they gave various reasons, but I would jump quickly and say, well, you're against Hosni Mubarak and so am I. Actually, I'm one of those guys who are planning these protests. And I'm going to live with you, and we need to get together. And this is our chance to get back what's ours. And of course, I have been, unfortunately, faced with like these responses. Like, you know. Of course not, are you crazy? Like, uh, I would never do that. Oh, you can go and you do that yourself and stuff like that. Why? And then I had three different types of answers. One that was related to fear, of course. People are afraid that they would make sacrifices for nothing. So they are afraid of getting killed, uh, injured, disabled, arrested, tortured, raped, etc. Another is related to this total lack of hope. People have no hope anymore. They just lost it. Total despair. So it's, what's the point? It's impossible. They have two million soldiers. Who can face that? There is no way. Like how many people do you expect will come out? It's always the same. The few hundred people maximum. And so what? I'm not going to go and do, put myself to hell, you know, for, for nothing. And there was another type of answer that was related to the economy. So again, economy seemed to be a very important point. So I would get even people that are against Hosni Mubarak and they would tell me, look, if I stop working for a day, I'm going to lose my job. I am the only source of money that feeds my household. Will you feed my family when I lose my job? Of course not. Sorry, I can't join you. But I like what you're doing. I support you. Okay, there was one last question, and that was the key. So, you're telling me you're against Hosni Mubarak, and I'm telling you we're going to do this, but still you, won't, you, you wouldn't come. Would you ever come? Yeah. It was very surprising that everybody would say the same. And uh, very surprising that I've been hearing these answers before, but always ignored them. Because maybe we play tricks to ourselves and we don't want to uh, really listen and see what's obvious. The answer was, when I see everybody else out there first, I will join them. That's right. Not by myself. When there are the large crowds in the street, there is no way I stay at home. I'll surely be one. When it is the big day and the real thing, I'll be on the front line and nothing can stop me. And this is what we're seeing now. By the way. Nothing can stop this. It's incredible. But but at that moment, when I finished all this survey, like I started at noon, I finished after seven. I was very tired and very frustrated because of the conclusions I had, not the solutions I had. The conclusions were: internet activists are only keyboard activists in a virtual reality. So we have always been failing because we shifted from the street tactics into the safety of the internet because of the crackdowns. That was not a solution. The only way to do an effective thing is to go back into the street and actually do the real thing. The internet, unfortunately, is a world where some persons that are lonely, they sit there, they like to help, they put a like or they put a 10, 
but they never take a step and do it. They don't say this to their family, they don't say this to their friends, they don't say it to anybody in the street, and nobody knows them. So we see them on the internet, we never see them in the street, and we cannot count on them. Things changed on the 28th, on January 28th, and I'll get to that. Things became very different on that, for a very important reason. But anyway, I don't want to jump. So the other very important conclusion was the only way to get people out is to get people out. <laughs> and it's, this seems to be a bit of chicken or egg. Yeah, right. no kidding. Yeah. So how can you solve this problem? <laughs> it's impossible. This is one of those situations that are totally impossible. Actually, there was a solution, but I didn't see it then. And uh, we failed, so it's over. And it was so hard, and it was so heavy, and like, oh my god, like, what are we going to do? This is the year of the transition, succession, this, that. I was trying to sleep, and then I started to remember not to remember, to think about my old plan and like if we can get anything done based on that plan. So the plan, as I said, was based on the need to have these different groups, small groups, who are working on, on the preparation of population in different areas in order to lead upon some point the protest in these areas so that we can have a simultaneous event happening all over the country in as many points as possible in every city with these groups heading into the central point in every city to occupy from every direction so it cannot be contained but then I started to think how can you do this first I don't have those people I don't have these groups and there is no way I can create them how, how to replicate this possibility okay do we really need them to be members of the same organization, do we even need them to be members of any movement? It doesn't have to be. Then the only point is if I can get volunteers. What I need is to get groups of volunteers in particular neighborhoods yeah. that can work together if I can get them to believe in the idea and get them tips on how to start it. Okay, I have invented some formations about street action that have been very successful. We have been trying that and it's been very successful, so I've been teaching this to many different activists from different parts of the world. I went into so many places teaching activists about how to do these things. And uh, I thought, okay, if I can give them these skills, they can work safely in their environment without being caught by the security. So they can distribute flyers without being caught, they can write graffiti without being caught. Uh, and they would know what are the formations to use, what are the time limits, and how to move from one point to the next, which are very important skills. And also, I added to that some rumors that they should spread. Oh, but then, God. yeah, one of these rumors was very important, and because it actually it happened, I mean, I, I, I didn't expect it to happen, but it happened, I will speak about that. In a the point still was how to get these groups and how to make them start something if people need others in the street to join because of course the volunteers will be small this was based on small groups small groups you cannot make more than that it's impossible and then as i was trying to sleep it suddenly struck me the idea of crowd is not only based on how many people but based on how many people and how big of space what is the space that contains this number of people we have always been choosing large spaces like we want to do something we come to a big place like this but we look at our number here we are a spot nobody can see us i mean i passed by you guys I didn't see. <laughs> so this is ridiculous to think that people will join a small crowd. But the best way, which I don't think you can replicate it here in America, is to start this from the back alleys, from the small streets. Because in these small streets, they are quite small and narrow. They are quite populous. There is always young people. And the sound is really big. 
and a small number of volunteers can make something really loud and attractive especially of course if that area is well prepared before because then people would know what those guys are shouting about and they would know that it's not some guys fighting or uh, some soccer match or i don't know what so i started to through my fiance and uh, other people who have been working on something called getting signatures on the statement for change a statement that a uh, uh, few hundred thousand people have signed and put their id information it was totally against the regime for a regime change so a person who would actually put their id information and signatures on these statements is doing something very brave very huge because in a very repressive environment like ours this means that you are now not no longer safe as a citizen you trust to the total uncertainty of being a target of the regime because you're enemy of the regime and uh, we had to try to see the people that seem to be in the same neighborhoods to try to get them so we're getting you know these guys coming to join and uh, i would be doing this crash course to them about how to do it, uh, how to prepare the area, as I said, what are the tactics, skills, and how to start on that day, starting from those small alleys up and down in each alley, very loud, trying to attract more young persons, and then to move around in the streets in that, the little bigger streets in between these alleys, and then into the more main streets, and then into the major streets, into the central point in every city that we want to occupy. One of the rumors, since I brought this issue, that I have tried to spread for the purpose of getting people to know about the day, was a rumor related to the day as being a day of huge protests and uh, rallies everywhere, which would mean that the military will go out to the street and there will be martial laws and curfew and no one will be able to buy any food supplies, so everybody must buy as much food as possible to store it for that case because it's a disaster and the the, the, the the target was grocery stores to try to spread this so that housewives would hear about it and they will tell each other and every house would hear about it <laughs> so this was uh, something that was totally a fiction in my point of view because there is no way it will really happen but actually of course it did happen on January 28th when the military came to the street, it was a curfew, it was impossible to buy food, and those who bought the food before, it helped them. <laughs> well, then I was doing this, thank you. Then I was doing this in Cairo, and in a few other cities, but there was not enough time, we were like, a little, you know, a week before it's supposed to happen. So doing this, like, to a group after a group in a few places. One city uh, we had a di I had a different plan for, which was Mahalla. This city, Mahalla, it was in rebellion in 2008, uh, a real revolution, and it was crushed by the regime in a very brutal and violent way. They used the security forces of five other governments, like states, you know, into only this small city and they crushed it for three days so uh, ever since then there was not a single protest in that city since 2008 until january 21st friday january 21st i got in touch with several activists from different del towns in the delta uh, in the north to all group in mahalla and make a protest there. the idea that wall that I had at the time was a little too pragmatic and maybe a little sinister in nature but for a good intention uh, which was Figure that if I want to give a chance to those volunteers those amateur uh, uh, you know amateurs who are ne not experienced with any activism then I have to mm, initiate something that is going to pull away the security forces and if Mahalla would rise then they will do the same story and they will get the security out of these different uh, uh, governors into Mahalla to crush Mahalla so everybody can rise. Thank goodness that was not necessary because everybody did rise. So uh, it was really incredible.
to tell you the truth of course i did not expect that there will be a revolution what i was doing was not building for a revolution although i was talking about a revolution inciting people for a revolution but i didn't think a revolution is possible i was defeated too many times to think it's possible we failed so many times my idea was that we are what i'm trying to do is trying to save the day so the day will be a big day of successful rallies of defeats of security that will give people hope and that this year that that year 2011 would still be the the, the year of the revolution based on the different groups of volunteers so we can do it as i've planned it previously in april or in uh, july of course that was i was wrong and i was very happy to do it uh, there was uh, also uh, this this protest was very successful in Mahalla because people had like their response was incredible and it seemed that Mahalla would rise and that really happened they they did incredible work they got rid of the security in the early hours of the morning first was no on the 21st yeah everybody did it on the 21st that was a Friday no it was a Tuesday yeah. uh, the Friday was January 21st when we did the protest there to get people to know because my idea was we don't need to play that trick tricky plan of mine for Mahalla what we need for Mahalla is that people would just know and if they know they will come out and that was, that did happen so it, it was it was a very successful part uh, of the plan another thing that uh, uh, is very much uh, worth mentioning was about a very important part of the Egyptian revolution that nobody gives much credit at all to. Uh, those guys are called the ultras. They are the soccer team supporters who are organized in majorly two groups. We're organizing two groups at that time. So uh, they are kind of enemies to each other because they support both uh, competing teams. <laughs> And I have been trying for years to get them into political activism, and I have failed. Actually, one of the former leaders of uh, one of the two major groups uh, was a guest in my house for a couple of months in 2006, and I was trying through him to get them into activism, but also that was not really uh, possible. Uh, I have always been hearing answers like they are they would never be involved in something political. It's not really their area. They are just for like liking their team and supporting their team and so on but in 2010 the regime did a few mistakes about them because they have in preparation for the succession from father to son in 2011 they wanted of course to make sure that they are in control of all these groups that those groups are not out of control so they started harassing them going to their homes and breaking to their homes and things like that and this had made these guys angry with the regime and with uh, the stick and uh, the carrot that is given to them all the time. Uh, so I have been able to actually get through to them and I played a little bit of a trick. I told each side that the other side is going and nobody would respect you if you don't go. <laughs> so with these guys, you know, this issue of respect and, you know, being a guy, being a man, being this, it's very important. So it was, it was, it was actually very successful. Uh, on January 23rd, I had confirmation from both sides of your coming. And without them, there would have been no January 25th. They were, they, they were the heroes of many different other battles. Um, January 24th was a day when I did absolutely nothing. Because I was, one, too scared of failure, two, very tired from all the effort and traveling, three, understanding clearly that whatever that could have been done had been done because you cannot get an area prepared in 24 hours so that's it whatever it is it's already happened 
And this is why the first day of the Egyptian Revolution, January 25th, was only in Cairo, the Delta, Alexandria, and the Suez Canal, because these were the areas where the plan was delivered. I was not able to go like to other further areas. Plus Sinai, but Sinai not because they followed the plan. We had an agreement with the Sinai activists that they would rise if we rise. So if they see us doing what we're doing, they would go out. And they did. So that was good. That was the only coordination. Uh, I delivered the, the plan to the political activists that I spoke about. Not to all of them, actually. I gave it to two of them uh, from my former movement, April 6. One is called Amrais, and the other is called Kamal Arafa, because they were uh, responsible for street action in uh, the movement when it was still one movement. Now, of course, it's, it's been split into three movements. So those two are belonging to the leaders of one of the, the factions, the Democratic Front. And uh, they, uh, they all took part, all those political activists, to start only one of the more than a dozen rallies that happened in Cairo. So all the other rallies, they were made by volunteers. No experience, never done it before, only faith and belief. And you would be very surprised because I've always been meeting these guys, very skeptical, like, who the hell is this guy? Why are we being dragged here? Why somebody's been begging us to come and listen to him? And like, you know, okay, shoot, what do you want? And then I start trying to talk to them and energize them. And give them the tactics and everything and make them understand that they are safe because the security would never risk it to go to the back streets because then their lines would be thin they could be ambushed and they are afraid of this because this is happening everywhere and because it's happening everywhere they would only have one solution withdrawal and strengthening their lines around the sensitive parts so that they make the big confrontations to crash the revolution but because we will have most of the cities free we can mobilize the people and this is the challenge this is your job this is your challenge you can get the people out. so this is just in short you know, the, last uh, the night of january 24th until january 25th in the morning of course i was so scared that i couldn't sleep until the early morning and then i fell asleep because I was too tired. Uh, then I woke up with my phone ringing. So I answered the phone and I heard this <laughs> like that and somebody shouting, telling me that they, it's, it's a total chaos. They defeated the security, the city is free and uh, that uh, uh, it's total dis civil disobedience, everybody's out. And using, you know, Arabic terms like it's all on fire, not really on fire like that, but like the people are out, you know, and, and so on. And I don't remember from which town this call that came to me, but I remember that when I hung up and I looked at the, the time, it was just a little after 11 in the morning. So it was so early. And like, oh my God, like 11 o'clock and it's happening already? <laughs> So I started to feel like, uh, you know, uh, it, it is for real. <laughs> um, I wanted to go to, to get dressed and <coughs> go out. And then the phone is ringing again and again and again from all these different towns and neighborhoods and uh, places about big rallies or about liberating areas or defeating the security or all sorts of good news. And it was incredible. I, I, I just managed to put on my clothes like around 12 o'clock uh, because I, I, I lost, I wasted too much time talking on the phone. And then when I, uh, when I got out, I was walking at first aimlessly because I didn't know where to go because all the rallies that spoke to me on the phone, they were a little far, like uh, in a few places that I would have to take transport to and I was thinking which should I join. And then I found a huge one a few minutes away from my house. So I joined it and then I started, some people recognized me, so I was started to lead and to tell people how to move. And uh, we went from 
my area into downtown just near Tahrir and then into another poor area like lower middle class poor and then back into my area Shobra and then back into Tahrir in order to get as many people as possible to our rally of course and people were joining it was growing it was huge like you cannot see where it ends and, like unbelievable well we got to Tahrir around uh, a little after four I don't know ten past four and uh, already most of the square was liberated and uh, other rallies were coming and uh, we were engaged in the fight with the security uh, those that were on the front line were the ultras that I mentioned before that's why I'm saying without them we couldn't have succeeded they are organized, sporty, dedicated and they are not trying to get any personal glory that's why nobody really has been hearing about them maybe until the massacre in Port Said when uh, there was retribution by security that claimed the lives of over 300 <laughs> uh, so uh, they uh, they were on the front line and those who seemed to be capable enough they would go on the front line because they get beaten up by the soldiers and they push the soldiers and beat them up and we throw stones from behind and all that until we managed to take Tahrir and then the battle continued because the security would try to enter Tahrir and we stopped them and the ultras tried to push even more into the parliament and they get beaten up and it was like back and forth until six o'clock there were orders for a ceasefire so security stopped attacking and we just took the square of course uh, I kind of was worried that uh, what happened in 2003 on March 20th would happen again with uh, the, you know, we occupied the Tahrir back then and we were defeated after midnight. We were attacked really very